Hello everyone, Mr. Falset here, and we are back with another Algebra 1 lesson. Today we are going to look at some word problems. So we did a little bit with word problems back in Unit 1 when we looked at verbal or word expressions, and we looked at how to transform them into algebraic expressions. But now we're going to actually look at some more in-depth word problems, learn how to set up equations, and then solve for whatever they're asking us to find. Before we do that, though, let's do a review of what we did in uh, unit one. So I have four problems here, and you just need to write the algebraic expression that represents the word expression. So pause the video, see if you can transform these words into numbers and symbols and maybe a variable or two, and then come back and see how you did. All right, so number one, it says five more than twice a number is equal to 21. So five more means we're going to be adding five. And twice a number means two times some number, but they don't tell us what it is, so we have to use a variable. So twice a number is going to be two times x, we'll let x be our variable. And then five more than twice a number means two x plus five is equal to 21. All right, on to number two, it says the quotient of 21 and a number is 12. Well, keyword here is quotient, that means division. So I have 21, and again, you can use whatever variable you want. I'm gonna use x. And then when it says is 12, that's just another word for equals. So 21 divided by x is equal to 12. Moving on to number three, it says three times the quantity of a number and five is equal to 33. Well, we know we have, we're multiplying by three because it says three times. Then it says the quantity. Whenever we see the quantity, that's gonna be something uh, generally in parentheses. So the quantity of a number and five. A number and five implies addition, so I'm gonna use x for my variable, so x plus five. Uh, that expression, let me erase that, is equal to 33. And moving on to number four, the sum of two consecutive integers is 17. So here, if we, if we think about this, what they're saying is that if I add, right, because sum means add, if I add two numbers together, I'm going to get 17. But these numbers have to be consecutive integers. So that means they could be three and four or maybe five and six, or maybe negative six and negative five. Now, the only problem is we need these two numbers to equal 17, and we don't know what the two numbers are. So we need to use some variables. So I'm actually gonna leave, well, I'll, I'll rewrite one of these. So if I, if I let my first integer be x, so I've got x plus something else. Now let's think back to those little number examples we just did. If my first number was five, well, my second number needs to be six, right? Because they're consecutive. If my first number was 11, my second number would be 12 because those are consecutive. So what you can see here is that I have to add one to whatever my starting number is. So I have x plus x plus one. And that is going to be equal to 17. That's what the is 17 represents. Okay, so hopefully you did well with those. Those are just kind of our little intro into our word problem lesson. So let's erase these and let's look at our first word problem. All right, number one, it says the length of a rectangle is twice its width. The total perimeter of the rectangle is 72 feet. So we have two pieces of information. We are asked to write an equation that can be used to solve for the perimeter. And we're gonna let x represent the width of the rectangle. After we write our equation, we're gonna find both the length and the width of the rectangle. So we've got a lot to do here. Uh, the first thing that I would do is without looking at the two questions they're asking, let's look at the scenario. Okay, so it's good to read the two questions first, but you may get a little overwhelmed if you're thinking about all the things we have to do. So I'm just gonna look at our 
uh, given information to start. So I, it says I have a rectangle, so I'm just going to sketch a little rectangle. All right, drawing a diagram can sometimes help, especially when you're doing something that involves a shape or something else that um, you can put on a diagram. It says the total perimeter is 72. Oh, sorry, let's, oh, let's back up a second. It says the length of a rectangle is twice its width. And notice down here it says let x represent the width of the rectangle. So I'm going to put x here. I'm going to put x here. That's going to represent the width. Now it says the length of the rectangle is twice its width. Well, if the width is x, twice its width would be 2x. So my lengths are 2x. And then it tells me that the perimeter is 72 feet. So I'm going to say perimeter equals 72. Okay, so it looks like we've labeled just about every piece of information uh, they've given us. Now we need to try to set up an equation. Well, you kind of have to know what perimeter means to be able to set up the correct equation. So if I just have a rectangle without any sides, right, a rectangle like this, let's say, let's say I actually give you some numbers. So let's say I have 4 and 4 and 7 and 7. You could pause the video and think about how you're going to find the perimeter. Well, the perimeter of this is just when you add up all the sides. So I'd get 4 plus 4 plus 7 plus 7. So the same principle applies up here. The perimeter is equal to x plus x plus 2x plus 2x. Now let's think, is there anything else that I can add to this equation? to help us solve. Because right now I still have two variables. I have the p and I have the x. And I can't solve the equation if I have two variables. Well, we know that the perimeter is equal to 72. So I can really say that 72 is equal to x plus x plus 2x plus 2x. And then it's just a matter of combining our like terms on the right hand side and doing some inverse operations. So I get 72 is equal to I have 6x's total. I'll divide both sides by 6, and I will get 12 is equal to x, or x is equal to 12. So you may think we're done. We found x. But remember, it asks us to find both the length and the width. That was right up here. That was part B. So we need to go back up here and do some substitution. I know that my width was x. Right, that's what I said the width was. And my length, oops, did a little undo there. I didn't mean to do that. Width, and my length is 2x. So if I want to find my width, well, my width is just x. So my width is 12. And we should put units on here, so 12 feet. My length was equal to 2 times x, or 2 times 12, and that's going to be equal to 24 feet. So this problem involved quite a bit of work, uh, more work than we've really done for our other problems, where all we've had to do is solve an equation. Uh, but again, if we, if we break it down, Right, we first started with just reading the information. Right, read the information. We drew a diagram because this problem was conducive to having a diagram. And then we tried to set up an equation. Once we had our equation, we kind of knew what to do because we've been solving equations all year up to this point. But break the problem down. Uh, don't get overwhelmed when you just read all the information. Just think about what you know and then use that to help you piece together the information into some sort of equation that you can solve. So let's move on to another type of example. We're going to do number two. All right, so it says the cost of two tables and three chairs is $705. Each table costs $40 more than one chair. 
Okay, so that's our given information. We need to write an equation that represents the total cost of the tables and chairs, and we're told that x will represent the cost of a single chair. Then we're, need, then we're ha going to have to find the price of both a chair and a table. So we have tables and chairs. So let's make a little, I'm not going to try to draw tables and chairs. That might end up going poorly, but I will put some little categories here that we can write some information under. So it says x is going to represent the cost of one chair. So x equals cost of one chair. Now, if x is the cost of a chair, well, it tells us that each table costs $40 more than a chair. So this kind of goes up to what we did in our do now right, $40 more, that implies addition. So x plus 40 equals the cost of one table. So if we had just one table and one chair, I could just add x plus 40 plus x, uh, equals 705. But we don't have just one chair and one table. We have, uh, it says, two tables and three chairs. So let's write a little equation out. I'm just going to use words first. Tables plus chairs, and this is the cost, remember. So the cost of tables plus the cost of chairs is equal to total cost. Right, if you go to the store, you buy three, t three chairs and two tables, then they're going to give you a total cost for all of those things when you get to the fr uh, front register. Well, the cost of two tables would be two times the cost of a single table. So two times the quantity x plus 40. The cost of three chairs would just be three times the cost of one chair, which was x, and then we know that the total cost, it told us in our given information, is equal to 705. So that would be the equation they're looking for. And now we just, again, have to, have to solve it. So I'm going to start by doing some distributing. So I get 2x plus 80 plus 3x equals 705. I can combine my like terms to get 5x plus 80 equals 705. I can subtract 80 from both sides, so I get 5x is equal to 625 if I subtract 80 from both sides. And then I divide both sides by 5. So 5x divided by 5 is x. 625 divided by 5 is 100. And 25. So x is equal to 125, which means that the cost of one chair is $125. It's an expensive chair unless it's a nice office chair. And then the price of a table, right, is just going to be $40 more than that. So the price of a table is going to be $165. So again, this one, we didn't draw the diagram. Uh, you could if you wanted to, just to uh, draw out your tables and chairs. Um, but I just listed tables and chairs in words because that was easier for me. Regardless, we took our given information, made an equation out of it, and then solved the equation. All right, let's see if we have time. We're certainly going to do one more. Maybe we'll have time for two more. All right, we'll do number three. So the cost of Jenny's September cell phone bill was $45. Each month, she pays a flat rate of $18 and then three cents per minute. So again, we need to write an equation for the cost of her cell phone bill in September. And this time, we're going to let M represent the number of minutes that she was on the phone. And then we're going to have to find out what M was. We need to find the number of minutes Jenny spoke on her cell phone in September. All right, so. And maybe you want to pause the video because now we've attempted to and see if you could set up an equation on your own.
to represent the cost of Jenny's September cell phone bill. All right, so it doesn't necessarily make that much sense to draw any sort of picture or diagram here. Um, but I am going to set up an equation uh, using words and then work our way into variables and numbers. And maybe you do have a good diagram that I just didn't think of and you could let me know what it was and uh, see how it or explain to me how it worked for you. I'm always interested in uh, things that students think of that I do not. So here we are given a couple of things. We're given a flat rate that Jenny has to pay and then she also has to pay for the amount of minutes that she's on the phone for. If I add those two things together then there's a total cost. So I have the flat rate plus the cost of the minutes that's going to equal the total cost. And you may have just used some different words here to represent these things. Um, that's okay as long as you know what they mean. We're just helping ourselves come up with a equation that we can then solve. So the flat rate's pretty straightforward. It says that is $18. Now the cost of the minutes is a little bit more tricky. She has to pay three cents per minute. So if she's on the phone for one minute in the month, she pays three cents. If she's on the phone for two minutes, she pays six cents, three minutes, nine cents, etc. So you've got to think, what operation am I using here? Am I doing 0 0.03 plus the amount of minutes? So 0 0.03 plus M. And maybe I'll just write out some scenarios for you. So we could have 0 0.03 because that's the amount per minute. Uh, plus M, which is the number of minutes. We could do 0 0.03 times M. We could do 0 0.03 divided by M. Maybe 0 0.03 minus M. So you got to think about which one, which one of these makes the most sense. Well, if it's three cents per minute, that means we are multiplying. So it's going to be 0 0.03 times M. And you could always uh, do some number examples, like I was saying. Um, if you know that it's got to cost her 12 cents for four minutes, right? Because three cents for the first minute, six cents for two minutes, nine cents for three minutes, 12 cents for four minutes. Well, see which one of these equations would give you 12 cents, right? And you would figure out that it ends up being this one right here. All right. So let's keep going with our equation. We know that this is equal to the total cost, which they tell us that as well. That is $45. And now we have an equation to solve. It's an equation with the decimal, but that's okay. We can do that. I'm first going to subtract 18 from both sides. So that is going to give me 0.03m on the left side after I subtract 18. And if I subtract 18 from 45, that gives me 27. I'm then going to divide both sides. I'll write this one out by 0 0.03. So I get M is equal to 900. So she was on the phone for 900 minutes in September. It sounds like a lot, but I guess it's about 30 minutes per day is still probably more than most people are on the phone uh, in a day. Uh, I guess you could have a job where you're on the phone a lot. Uh, but I, I digress. That is not part of the <laughs> part of the question. All right. Uh, let's take a look at the next one real quick. Let's see if we have time. I'd actually like to do one of the final set of problems. So yeah, we're going to do this one. Uh, number five. So it says Josie gets a weekly allowance of $20. She also makes $2 for each tour that she completes. And last week, last week she made $76. So for part A, it says write an equation that represents the amount of money Josie made last week. But this time it says choose your own variable and make sure to state exactly what it represents. So in our previous problems, they've already told you what variable to use and they told you what it needed to represent. So this problem's a little different. And part B says, find the number of chores that Josie completed last week. 
So a couple things here. One, uh, when you choose a variable, you can use just about any letter you want. Unless they've already used another letter uh, in the problem, then you don't want to choose the same letter. You want to use a different one. The second part, which is a little tougher, is knowing what the variable is going to stand for. So it says choose your variable. That's the easy part. Choose a letter. And then make sure to state exactly what it represents. Well, the variable stands for our unknown. So the variable is going to represent what we're trying to figure out. In this case, we're trying to figure out the number of chores that Josie completed last week. So I'm going to choose C because chores starts with a C, but you can choose X, you can choose Y, you can choose whatever letter you want. So I'm going to say let C, that's our variable, represent the number of chores it's not the best J I've ever drawn number of chores Josie completed last week now yes you do need to write this out um, this is good practice though because as you move forward with higher level math classes you're going to continue to work with these variables and you're going to continue to have to understand what they represent. Um, so let's get a good foundation now and then the rest of this year will be a little bit easier but so will geometry and algebra 2 etc. So now we're going to set up a word equation because we don't have any shapes or anything that we can draw a diagram for. So it says Josie gets a weekly allowance of $20. So that's kind of her base her base rate right so we're going to say the allowance is the first part of this. Now, she also gets additional money if she completes chores. So we're going we're gonna to add to the allowance money from chores. that's going to equal the total amount of money that she makes. So total money made. So the allowance is easy because that is just $20. That's set. The money from chores is a little different. So it's $2 per chore or two dollars for each chore so again you got to think am I gonna divide the number of chores by two am I gonna add uh, two to the number of chores well it's actually multiplication here just like it was for our last one so it's gonna be two times C and you could think if she does ten chores she's gonna make twenty dollars that's two times uh, the number of chores two times ten that is equal to the total money that she makes, which we know this week was $76. So there's our equation. Now we just have to solve. I'm going to subtract 20 from both sides. That's going to leave me with 2C equals 56 after I subtract 20 from both sides. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2, and I get C is equal to 28. And remember, C represented the number of chores. So we're going to use our units, which in this case are chores. So she did 28 chores last week. All right, you've got some more problems you can attempt on your own. Some of them, they tell you what the variable represents. For others, it's like this problem where you have to choose your own variable and then write a little sentence about what it represents. So you can give those other ones a shot. Write down any questions you have so we can discuss them at a later date. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you next video.